This is Solar Gray, the Cinematic Source. We're in. How you guys doing out there today in Twitch land? I want to say like Twitch land or TV land or something that kind of cute. But yeah, no, I'm not going to go there. <laughs> like seriously, I'm not. But as I was saying, I am Solar Gray, the Cinematic Source. We're, look at that. Oh, we got new title card. Oh, yeah. yeah. Look at that. All right. And I want to say thank you for showing up again this week to the game gallery and i am here today with my very good friend design dig dug or not yeah that's right Ooh, Ooh man. yeah oh, that's you can see me yeah you can that's, see me real that's, well that's yeah that's oh wait sorry my bad there we go <laughs> <laughs> yeah hi everybody yeah yeah <laughs> that is a thing so yeah that is yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no it's it, it's a thing hey it's life happens thing. yeah it does it, it really does so well thanks for having me back man as always hey you know what man you know, I'm, I'm always glad to be here yeah seriously it has been a thing we're actually getting started far more far more on time which is a very neat thing and we're working on it at least you know. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, regimentation, organization, shit like that, or stuff, stuff like that, uh -huh. stuff like that. Yeah. Oh man, showing so, yeah. up on time and having everything ready to go feels good. Feels well, good. You man. know, working on it. I've been trying to do this new thing where I wake up earlier, which is tough because like everything in my regular life is set to where I'm working until two, three, four, or five in the morning. Yeah. So that's getting up at garbage. seven or eight. Um, kind of makes me useless after I broadcast. Yeah, I do not envy that at all. <laughs> I mean, I, I have the uh, extreme luxury of, which I have, I recognize as a luxury and a privilege, uh, <laughs> that I get to work at normal hours and sleep at normal hours, which, as someone who used to also stay up you know, all hours of the night doing whatever the heck I wanted and sleeping in because I could, I... Uh, it's interesting being able to just go to the bank during normal business hours because that's when I'm awake and that's when the bank's open and I don't have to like weirdly wake up at strange times just to make my life happen. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. With that, I have to say like, what what's that like? <laughs> yeah, it, it took getting used to. That, yeah, it yeah. took some getting used to, but I'm, I'm going to be honest with you, it's, uh, it's living better on this side. I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure it is. I'm sure yeah. it is. Oh, man. But, yeah, we got some stuff. We got a whole bunch of stuff coming out this week. Um, whole bunch of stuff. We did so, so, so much. Um, I'm still recovering. One of my, well, my night job called me up on Friday, um, which is good because it was going to be Saturday and I was going to be, like, totally burned out for today as well. Ah. But, um, yeah, they gave me a call and they're like, hey, can we reschedule the thing? Now, I do people's hair. You know, mm -hmm. I cast spells inside people's um, follicles and stuff like that. But it's a long process. It is a really, really long process. We're talking uh, anywhere from a 12 to 15 hour ritual. Yeah. So it started raining um, yeah. while I was out. And as you guys know, I ride a motorcycle. So... <laughs> Yeah, rain I'm is not there. just an inconvenience for you. It is a very severe danger. Oh, uh, well, you know, it's kind of a thing. It would be worse. It would be a lot worse if in. Um, well, actually, no, it's it's a little bit worse for me because I don't use a full face helmet. Mm -hmm. um, I need you to scoot to your right just a little bit. There you go. All right. I, I meant like slide a oh. bit to your right. There we go. Yeah, that's yeah. it. All right. Yeah, sorry, your your head was getting in into the shot yeah. there. You were like, oh, pff, no worries. <laughs> um, but yeah, so um, I ended up I ended up having to ride twenty miles at four a.m. <clears throat> in the rain. <clears throat> so I'm tired. I'm blind. The <laughs> the stuff is stinging, and you know. But I showed up. I did yesterday's show, and um, all is well because work ethic is a real thing. You know, if I don't respect you guys that show up to my show, then how can I expect you guys to respect what we're trying to pull off here as total? That's Fair the point. burden of leadership, kids. <laughs> Fair point, man. Yeah. See. Oh, I'm still in the shop mostly. Yeah. Right. yeah. Oh, cool. no, that was, there you go. Now All you right. can take a look. See? Yeah. You oh. know, I'm, my head's not in your shot. So. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. Come anyway, on, I trust that I know what I'm doing. I, I trust you know what you're doing, man. You know, just trust me on this one. I'm just going to... Oh, yeah, just... Oh, oh, oh yeah, oh, there we go. So hey, just, all yeah. right. Yeah, there we go. 
But so yeah, yeah, man, it's been, uh, th- this was my birthday week, among yes. other things. Hip-hop um, birdies to, to yeah. Jews, Yeah, welcome man. to birth. Yeah, um, welcome to birth. Yeah. Wait, welcome to birth? <laughs> that is terrible. Yeah, it is. It yeah, is absolutely it is. atrocious, and I make that joke every year and have for a long time. I mean, don't get me wrong. Uh, one of my favorite, oh, man. Oh, yeah. hello there. Yeah, one of my favorite, um, one of my favorite things to say is straight from Metalocalypse. Which okay. is many years ago today, something grew inside your mother, <laughs> and that thing was you. <laughs> yeah. Well, ideally, what you're what you're saying at that point is many years ago today, something was no longer growing inside your mother. But <sighs> you millennials just then. Well, actually, well, you said actually, uh, it, it yeah. is Leviosa, not <laughs> Leviosa. Yeah, shut up. You know what I mean. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I, I ended up getting into a big, big, big argument on Facebook because, um, I read an article about, um, about burnout Yeah, in your guys' generation. I think I was the one who posted that article. Yeah. And I read it and I read it and... That was a rough article for me to get through and just like, oh yeah, let's go ahead and read. Oh no. <laughs> oh. Oh no. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Oh my. Mm, yeah. Mm. And I took a look at it and one of the things is whether or not I agree with it, all of the individual points that led the author, author to the conclusion, I understood cuz I watched it all. I watched it all happening, the regimenting yeah. of childhood. Yeah. I'm like, you know, when I was a kid, it was just get the hell out of the house. Now, don't get me wrong, mom wanted to get drunk but um well, it was get out there a free play was a thing there wasn't the paranoia of my kid's going to get kidnapped but i also lived in the ghetto so yeah. when you live in the ghetto there's not much concern about your kids getting snatched because everybody's broke so, <laughs> so yeah who's gonna snatch kids? yeah it's, it's yeah. like you know who's gonna rob the broke guy you know yeah. it, it's one of those things. i remember even even when I was a kid, there was a lot of concern over, um, uh, you know, over kids being kidnapped all the time. Mm-hmm. And I wonder how much of that was truly valid. But given how it seems to be a relatively big concern still today, and Amber Alerts are going out, and like it's it's enough of a concern that I'm not super thrilled about letting my daughter just run out. So I'm not sure where to like walk that line between not being a helicopter parent. But also making sure my daughter's safe. In it's, truth, it's a matter of really understanding what the bad guys want. Because if you don't have what the bad guys want, they're not going to pay any attention to you. Is the risk worth the stretch? Yeah. Is your kid worth taking? Well, you don't have any money. <laughs> so they're not going to be um, ransomed. So that takes it from 100% to 40%. Yeah. You know? And that's that's big. And... 40% is not a bad percentage when it comes to child endangerment. I know, I know, just follow me here. No, I, because, I, I see what you mean. Uh, I'm, I'm, talk, I'm talking yeah. to them. Okay. Because, um, you know, yeah, 40%, it's like, oh my God, there's a 40% chance my child might get hurt. Yes. Yes, there is. Um, if you let them, like, even an, in scheduled play, they can still get burned or bashed or they can skin a knee or do stuff like that. Like, we played with garbage, which is why our immune systems are <laughs> all the way up here, okay? Because, yeah. you know. My, my daughter is very fond of floor snacks and garbage. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah that... she, she I, I swear to God, she's going to be uh, the most disease-resistant human on the planet by the time she's <laughs> done. I'm just like, can you... Can you not just shove random trash in your mouth? Uh, I'm, I'm glad you found a bunch of rocks and dirt and also some trash. And who knows where that lollipop came from. But I'm glad it's all in your mouth at once right now. Thanks for that. And you know what? If she had the articulation, when you asked that question, her answer would be no. Yeah. <laughs> Can yeah. you not put that in your mouth? No. <laughs> yeah. No, it's great watching because she, she doesn't have the articulation, but she has the comedic timing. I swear, like this kid, like I'll be like Charlie, what's in your mouth? And she's like, look at me, and then just like, li- like perfectly on cue with no like, just it could not have been time better. She just, uh, and then, like all this stuff just dribbles out of her mouth. I'm just like, why are you like this? And then she just like, and I'm yep. like, that's what having that, a two year old is yep, like. That's a yep. Good. What's knows, in your mouth? The cat. 
Yeah. yeah. But it's it's not like it's not like oh I'm gonna like scare you with it. It's just like you know, I know that you know, and you know what I'm gonna do? I'm just gonna like dramatically uh, <laughs> and, like let like rocks or whatever fall out of her mouth. And I'm just like and then she smiles at me like, Yeah, I did that. And, and you're, you're gonna clean it <laughs> up. Yeah, exactly. And <laughs> I'm just know. like, You little butt. Yeah. Love her to death, but yeah. Yeah, so um before we get caught up in parental musings and stuff like that, I do want to thank you for being here. Yeah. Um, and I want to thank you guys for being here. All you guys watching that aren't participating in um, in Peace City, that's cool. That's cool. Or, I totally Or I all totally of our viewers that. who are watching uh, the recording of it and are not able to watch the live cast. Thank you. Yeah, those of you guys that are watching from the archives. Hello, future people. <laughs> we are talking to you from the past. Yeah. I, have, um, I have many friends who end up watching the show after we record it and then you know get excited and want to talk about stuff and i'm like you gotta, you gotta tune in when we're doing this you can actually like put this in the chat I'm like well i wasn't available that time i'm like i get it yeah. so i appreciate the people in the future are still watching us now yeah and they get to see what we look like unlike that stupid facebook trend oh my god uh, what now post a picture of yourself from 10 years ago and now uh. how has time aged you um, please allow our facial recognition software to become far more yeah. accurate. I'm like, here's the funny thing about that for me. I'm not participating in the challenge for one reason. Oh, okay, I'll bite. What's the reason? I look exactly the same. Mm. I'm not participating in the challenge for also exactly one reason. You're staying the crap off of Facebook. Hey! <laughs> yeah, yeah I, just, right. I, I don't follow the trends. I don't do anything on Facebook that I yeah, can avoid. No, no, you, so. you, you stay off of Facebook like yeah. a really wise man. Um, yeah, because it turns out if you just don't put anything on Facebook, the algorithm doesn't have a lot to work with in terms of, like, getting all that metadata on you. You know, it just, <laughs> they're like, okay, so what is he about? Well, he doesn't really put anything on here, so... Yeah, so I, I post pictures of my daughter, so it knows I have a kid. It knows I have a kid, and I do stuff with that kid. And it knows what I look like, because I'm in some of those pictures as well, and knows what she's looked like. So, uh, all right. Now, the truth is... Oh, my God, we're under attack. Oh, we're under attack. We're oh, under attack. Yeah, ah. I, see, I see. Yeah, no, and in truth, um, no, nah, they're not going to get your information from Facebook. Because you're all good. Amazon's got all oh, yours. Oh, yeah. I'm, <laughs> saying, I, I'm, I'm Amazon's uh, little little bee. You know, yeah. they, Amazon can just bend me over and take me at this point. And yeah. It's just, no, it's, it, it, it's true. Um, but, you know, thank you for being here. Thank you, guys. And I want to say what's up to the deck mob. What's going on, guys? Woo! Yeah. Yeah, it's over in NB NB City. City. Yeah. Yeah. Wee, 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 wee. <laughs> All right, all right, all you guys at this bar mitzvah, get on the train. It's time to do the electric slide. So, uh, yeah, but that that's what's going on. Um, we've got a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff yeah, to talk about. Yeah, we got an about. exciting show planned. Yeah, but before we do, um, I need to tell these people that, you know, if you guys are, like, all happy about being here and stuff like that, then that's cool. I think you guys might also have a decent time over on Deckers on the Book, which is our Facebook group. Where, oh, look, there is my face talking about, hey, come on down here and do all that stuff. But we got the announcements and checking out, yeah, look, it's Joe Maganella playing D&D with kids in a hospital. You want to see that? Go on over to Decker's on the book. Yeah, that was and, a good video. Um, huh? That was a good video. I it really was. And, and you know, that's what we are actually working toward right mm -hmm. now. But we're having a hard time working toward that because it costs a lot of money to go around the country. Like train tickets and plane tickets and stuff, that stuff is expensive. So if you guys want to help or know anybody that wants to help, um, instead of direct donations, you can help us out in a really personal way by becoming a patron. Yeah. Over here on Patreon. Now this week we have uploaded a bunch, and I mean a bunch, 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 bunch a free content that we can put up and that you guys can watch and check out what we're up to. Essentially, if you go through all of the hours and hours and hours of the archive that's on Patreon, you guys get to see how far we've come because I put like stuff from way back when we were doing this show with just two iPhones. Yeah, <laughs> um, oh, man, those were the days. Yeah, those yeah. were, you know. Well, yeah. let me rephrase that. Those were days. 
No, those were the days, man. They really were. Yeah. Those were the days where we showed that we are seriously into doing this. We are going to do this by hook, by crook. That's true. Um, but yeah, so, I mean, seriously, um, we're there. But um, got to start off today with, um, you know, we've got a few we've got a few things to discuss. Yeah. Um, but the first thing, first thing I want to get into, you know, um, oh, yeah, yeah, sorry, I forgot. Yeah, we do. Well, do we? Yeah, I'm not even going to go there. Um, yeah, the first thing I want to discuss is there was a new product that came out. And by new, it came out in September. Okay. But it's from Wizards of the Coast, right? Yeah. So anything... Which, they've, they've just been knocking it out of the park as oh far as their, the, the products they're releasing, the supplements for D&D. I haven't started messing with D&D Beyond yet, but everyone I've talked to swears by it at this point. That it's I this, do. Yeah, I do. <laughs> it's, it's a it's a digital for those you don't know a digital supplement for Dungeons and Dragons. We can track all of your various character stuff, your uh, all the stuff you've gotten. It does the math for you. So it's it's a way to take this old analog system, take it into the modern age, but lose none of the stuff that makes the old analog system good in terms of getting together with people in person. It, right. it seems fantastic. And the truth is, you can even start. No, we're not being sponsored by that. <laughs> but you can even start. Like you can start with D and D Beyond because one of the things that D and D Beyond focuses on is you can buy. Oh God, stop it, stop it! Um, you can actually folk. You can you can get the D and D Beyond app and you can buy the PDFs for all of the core books mm -hmm. at a twenty dollar discount Ooh. from the store. So you know, as you know, I keep hard copies of everything, yeah. but I do have digital copies of everything as well because I'm generally running the games, right? Yeah. So I'm going, all right, I've got my copy. I know yep. all this stuff, but then when players have questions and they're in the room, I'm like, turn to page 78, yep. you know? But with D&D Beyond, um, you can track all your character information, but you buy the PDFs through the app and it integrates with the app. That's uh, awesome. Could you get the door in there? Sure. Also push over that chair. But yeah, but... <clears throat> They have been knocking it out the park, and no, we don't mean to make this a commercial for D&D Beyond. And guess what? I know, all right? I know, you know, congratulations for being superior. There are a, a, there are other apps that people prefer. There are ways to do it better and stuff like that. But doesn't matter, okay? If you don't like a product, don't buy the product. If somebody else likes the product, don't tell them that they shouldn't like the product. Yeah. And speaking of... Yeah. Yet another product I want to talk about, um, the Endless Quest novels. Yeah. yeah. These things. Um, for those of you guys that grew up in the way that I grew up, um, these are, ooh, wait, wrong ones, wrong ones, okay. Yeah, the Endless Quest books are um, a flashback to the Endless Quest series of 1983. Okay. Um, 1983. Um, TSR, the original company of Gary Gygax and the yeah. other two guys, um, <clears throat> said, you know what? We like choose-your-own-adventure novels, and D&D &D is essentially writing a choose-your-own-adventure novel. Right. So let's publish some choose-your-own-adventure novels. And, set um, in a fantasy setting. And... Uh, set in our fantasy setting. Right. So they're set in D&D. &D. And um, hmm. they, um, they decided a couple of years ago um, to pick up an author by the name of Matt Forbeck who'd been writing for supplements and game books for a while and said, hey, we want some choose your own adventure books for them kids out there. You, you get to it. Make that other stuff. And I was, I believe in Burbank, um, checking out another store that I might be able to feature on one of the shows. And I saw two of them. Hmm. And I'm like, they do choose your own adventure novels? You know? <laughs> and, um, they're like, yeah, yeah, it's a total series of four. And I'm like, oh, that's everything. Had I not already bought the spell deck and blown my budget for the day, I would I would have bought these, but that's okay. Um, and so, of course, with the help of much, much technological magic and things that have giant rivers and indigenous people who use spears and blowguns. So I went to the Amazon and, um, <laughs> and I managed to acquire the other four books. And right now I'm only holding this one, the... 
Endless, Endless Quest. Endless Quest. Escape the Underdark, which is you awesome. You are the fighter. Yes, okay. you're the fighter. Now, Neat. unlike um, one series, and I forgot what it was, but I was I was looking for it. I was looking for it uh, a long time ago where you actually create your own character and go through everything and actually have the fights and all that Interesting. stuff. Interesting. Um, but <clears throat> beyond that... Um, they have the feeling of the old um of the old choose your own adventure novels. They're not as bloody. But I can, um, I can see that. The D D has, like a lot of things, been pretty sanitized in a lot of senses, but um I would be interested to read the old ones and see just how bloody they are by comparison. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And um so I checked I, I I checked them out. I read I only went through half of each one just to get the gist so we could talk about it here. Um, but yeah, there was, there is a lot of stuff that's going through there and they're fun. They're for ages like seven to 12, which is awesome. Um, or sorry, um, 10 to 12 and 12 and up, but let's face it. If it's made for kids, my generation and your generation are going to do it. And we're going to be mad that it's not for us. I mean, <laughs> I'm, I'm not mad that it's not for us. <laughs> like I'm still going to do it, but like, I feel like something marketed at kids can be used by adults and we don't need to be concerned that it's not for adults. We just enjoy the fact like, look, this is kid stuff. And then if we want to get something real nasty and bloody, there doesn't seem to be a shortage of that out there. Also, well, you the know, that's, the that's the father in you talking. Your, your perspective is changing because a lot of stuff that's out there that's marketed for not us, um, get commented, especially on the internet by us saying why isn't it for us there's nothing original out there and it's like there never was anything original out there you just hadn't read everything yeah you hadn't seen everything but when you go into it with that mindset these books are fun (laughs) they really are fun nice um well having not read them yet can mm -hmm. you can you tell me a little bit about uh some of the ones that you've you've checked out here well there's only four on the market Okay. okay and on the market um, there is Escape the Underdark. Well, there is the Fighter Adventure, the Cleric Adventure, the Magic Slinger, and the Thief so far. The next four are coming out this year. So they're okay. going to cover. Because, you know, there's 14 character classes yeah. in D&D. So. Might as well do the whole thing. Yeah, yeah, I, I would. And um, it literally is page one. This is where you are. This is your decision. If you choose option A, turn hmm. to this page. If you choose option B, turn to this page. And it's got an interesting set of of mechanics when you're reading it. Yes, there are mechanics in reading a book. Yeah. Where uh, there would be many times where I would turn to page like 17, but on page 18, it's your character dies the end. But I'm reading page 17, and it doesn't spill over to, <laughs> to yeah. page 18. So I'm like, ah. The toughest part about this is, and this is a personal thing. Well, not personal. This is actually a reader's thing. Um, the toughest part is actually going to be for any of you guys that have never read a choose your own adventure novel, this is for you. And for those of you guys that grew up reading choose your own adventure novels, y'all know exactly what I'm about to get into, which is reading the books and being honest with yourself about it. Yeah. Like I am going to take this decision and read it out. I think I might die. Let me just go on the other. Yeah, you know, it's one of those. And that's the playing while trying to win scenario. Yeah. So I started reading it. And if you do it like that, the book takes a half hour. Okay. If you do it the way I did way, way back in the 80s, I play everything (coughs) out until my character either finishes the story or dies. Yeah. And then I start over. Because um, I don't keep notes when I'm reading these things. So sometimes I found that I was, um, I was, um, what was the term? I was choosing the same stuff over and over again because I forgot how I got to my death. Mm. It was like, yes, that makes actual sense. I will go this way. Oh, crud. All right. Well, I'm going to do the other thing this time. But then after three or four times through, it's like, did I, which one killed me? Well, no, I think I killed this and the, and it went through kind of the decision gates that we were talking yeah. about last week. So, and that when I, also read choose your own adventure books in the public library because mm-hmm. you know i did um i was always uh you know sticking fingers into pages as i flipped through so i could always flip back to reverse the decision to and you know so i always had like you know three four something are, like, you, are you just talking with the geeks meow right now 
<laughs> right now what? in the chat. Oh. oh, I use my fingers as bookmarks to track my choices. <laughs> <in there. laughs> yeah. No, I, I hadn't seen that. Um, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, that was how I always did it. And then I would flip back and try to like, oh no, I died. Well, I'll just go back to this decision. And, you know, so I, I enjoyed that. Um, so I have a, I have a couple of questions about these books. Okay. Do they read like, um, like a single player D and D adventure? Sort of. Um, I would say yes, they read like it, except you don't get to um, write your own character. Sure, um, sure. I'm saying like you, you're given a pre-gen character of, as we saw, the fighter. You're a fighter in D and D. Does this play out like you were given a character sheet and you're getting to play through a single player adventure with like an AI dungeon master? The answer is, let's read a couple of pages. <laughs> okay, sure. Read through the playthrough. <clears throat> Page one. The last you remember, you are in a tavern, about to embark on your new career as an adventurer. A pale dwarf in a hooded cloak had sat you down to have a drink while he offered you a map to a dungeon that he claimed was packed with treasure che treasure chests ripe for the plundering. But then the room got fuzzy and started to spin. You nodded off. The <laughs> you nodded off right there at the table, and the next thing you knew, you woke up here. Only you're not exactly sure where here is. It's cold, dark, dank, and the floor is nothing but bare, rotten woodwork. You sit up, and the chains that connect the manacles on your wrist to the belt locked around your waist jangle. You swallow hard and realize that an iron collar is constricting your neck. Finally awake, are you? He says with a vicious grin that bears his sharp white teeth. Welcome to Velkinyev. Where? A shiver runs down your spine as you realize how much trouble you're in. The underdog, one says behind you. The deep gnome laughs at you. We're stuck in a giant spider-infested cavern a half mile beneath the surface of Faerun. None of us even know how we got here. And they work us so hard, the only thing we're good for after is sleeping it off. If you can find a way, we'll follow. Well, if you can find a way out, though, we'll follow. Um, you have three options now. Bide your time. Turn to page six. Fight. Turn to page nine. Escape. Turn to page 17. Which do you choose? Hmm. I'll take bide my time. We are turning to page six. <clears throat> you decide that the only way you're going to get out of here is if you somehow pit your jailers against one another. And that sort of thing takes time. So you dedicate yourself to becoming a model prisoner, the kind that follow orders and causes no trouble. You soon learn that your master is a female drow named Elarva Miserimama, the priestess of the spider goddess Lulf. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Okay. You manage to avoid angering either one of them, but you know your time is running short, and if you make your move soon, you'll be shipped off to Menzo Brazahan, the great drow metropolis where it might be impossible for you to escape from there. I wish to all our I wished all our prisoners were as easy as you, Jordan says, as he locks you back into your cell after a long day. I'll miss when they take you away tomorrow. Most slaves are hard to break in. So do you ally with one guy or the one who thinks that you're a good slave? And just keep going through a nice. story like that. Yeah, and so that that does really answer the question. Like it does feel like we have a storyteller with some good exposition. Mm -hmm. Uh we have some clear decision gates. Um, obviously, by the very nature of the format, it's going to be a bit railroaded. Um, and it sounds like it answers the other question I hadn't asked yet. Which is? Which is, uh, how would it fare as fodder for uh, using an actual D&D &D campaign? And it sounds like it'd be pretty good. In truth, yeah. Um, not going to lie, as a GM, I had, I had these um, four books shipped to me through Amazon because I'm like, well, it's a choose your own adventure thing. And as a GM who is now running a game once a week, yeah, um, I may have 16 weeks of weekly one shots planned <laughs> and written out. Right. <laughs> However, I'm going to, that ain't going, that's only going to last 16 weeks. So where can I cannibalize ideas yeah. from? Because talent borrows ideas from one place. Oh, another. absolutely. And genius steals outright. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And like, from what we've seen so far, like, I could absolutely 
take this entire thing that we've just done and be like, okay, cool. It's a whole party of four people. You're all here in the same situation. How do you want to handle that? You know, and, and you could easily spin a lot of this, it seems like, into a whole adventure. You got a setting, you've got a reason you're all here. Sure, you can have a whole thing, depending on how this adventure goes, you could read through it, and you could make most or all of an adventure just pulling from this one choose your own adventure book. Exactamundo, which let's face it, most of the GMs that trained us, we know you did it. <laughs> we know there's no explosive decompression in fantasy games. Now, um, most of my choose your own adventures were the ones you got from the library yeah. that were all sci-fi, yeah. go underwater yep. in a submarine or yep. something like that. No, I, I remember all those sci-fi ones dying out in space. <laughs> yeah. 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 And underwater. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And in caverns. Yep. There was a lot of death. A yeah, lot. Like, even I, more than Oregon Trail. It was <laughs> well, Oregon Trail. You die a lot if you're not doing it right. So it's <laughs> you know it, it's always a thing like you died of dysentery. Well, maybe you shouldn't have been drinking the water along the way because you forgot to like stock up. Like I, I feel like this is your fault, really. But no, well, fair yeah. enough. Fair enough. Um, so, um, so that's um, that's one of the things. Now here's the upside. You can find these things on Amazon for like six bucks each, six to seven. Oh, nice! In the in the brick and mortar stores, like any of the ones that we show on backinthedeck.com, mm -hmm. they're like eleven or they're like yeah eight to ten dollars, eight to twelve dollars. Okay. So it's not that big a deal. You know how I am. Yeah, I, I am Mister. Here's my money. Give me my thing. Yeah. Um, so if you want to just go to the store, pick up the thing, you're looking at eight bucks. If you want to wait a few days on Amazon, you're looking at maybe a dollar or two off. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So that's, that's pretty cool. Things. I'm, I'm going to pick up, uh, I'm gonna pick up some of those for myself because I can always use more, um, I can always use more ideas for DMing and I certainly can afford it at that price point. Well, so. you say pick some up for yourself. I'm thinking the kids. Hey, kids, sit around. We're going to have a thing. Well, my daughter's got a few years before she's going to be at choose-your-own-adventure levels of storytelling, but I think that it would absolutely be something that, were I familiar with it at that point, would be pretty good. Exactly. So that's um, that's one of the really cool things that I was, I was checking out this week. But we've got a serious, serious conversation that we need to have. Um, Are we... Hmm? Uh, my, my thing says we're offline. Oh, no, we're on. Oh, okay. We're on. I'm looking at the thing, and we got six viewers going and all okay. that jazz. Cool. So, um, yeah, so as I was saying, um, we got some stuff to talk about. Now, last week, I posted a, you know, I gave them a preview of what we're talking about. I want to do that a lot more often. And, um, and I posted a question on Twitter, um, a topic of discussion one would say that I posted on Twitter and the Instagrams and I got some good feedback yeah. from a lot of interesting people and um, one of the things that we're talking about is what C.S. Lewis called chronological snobbery Yeah, <laughs> and um, I, I want to talk about kind of how it goes both ways because there's one thing that you and I talk about on this show a lot mm -hmm. um, and that is the difference in our taste in fictional escapism um, yes yeah and there's obviously a lot of overlap but there's you know the the big thing is you're you're really hard on this idea of like you want to be involved in science fiction and, and futurism in a, no small part because the world is looking at it as like, yeah, we're making things better. We are, we are progressing towards a better society. Mm -hmm. I absolutely can respect that and then get into that. Yeah, and fantasy gives this big trope of the days of the most epic things, the best adventurers and the best fighters and the, and the most potent magic and the most glorious cities like Atlantis and, and, and Babylon. They were all in the past. They're never coming back and you missed it. So, yeah. you know. Which I think a lot of that is our, it's, it's specifically modern fantasy looking at the past where uh, from modern human perspectives, we have ancient civilizations and, you know, the... It's a it's a trope in Western culture that 
the Roman Empire was like this pinnacle of civilization. And after the fall of the Roman Empire, things were never quite as good again. N despite you can like make a whole bunch of arguments like, well, look, man, like the Romans never had like electricity and cell phones. And, like, <laughs> there were a lot of things the Romans didn't have. And sure, as far as a classical civilization went, they were pretty top notch. I mean, they had running water. Mm -hmm. They had, you know, they had a, a lot of nice stuff. But, like, they weren't exactly the pinnacle of human achievement, but still, from a modern perspective, I mean, this goes back to about the 1600s or so, we've always been looking back when the Enlightenment started, you know, like, Greeks and Romans were the pinnacle of civilization, and we've been on a, you know, things have been bad ever since. Again, even still at that point, things were in a lot of ways better than they were during Greek and Roman times, but that idea has persisted in Western literature and culture that the past was better. Greeks and Romans were better and the water, modern world just isn't quite there. Yeah. Hail Atlantis, way down yep. beneath the ocean. But, um, <clears throat> yeah, I'm, I mean, I know, and I need to put this out there right now. It's possible that everything we're going to talk about can be applied to modern politics, but we're not talking about politics yeah. today, okay? I just want to put that out there as close as, as it's like right here. It's mm -hmm. right here, making its way to my tongue, yep. you know, but not going to do it, not going to mention anything about baseball caps in certain colors, yep. not going to mention anything about that. Yep. We are strictly talking um, from, yes, a cultural standpoint. Well, and, and it's, um, it's specifically yep. a modern cultural narrative and i say modern in the historical sense of it which is basically from the late 1800s onward um you know this, this idea that the past was something that was better than the the present is and the future needs to be a return to the past well let's um let's let's go there there's a word that uh, that has come up a lot in this discussion okay um on twitter on Facebook, on Instagram, and that's better. Yes. Um, <clears throat> I I don't like using the word better. I want to define better. Um, when I talked about it, um, when I posed the question, and I may have posted it off, I brought up the token idea, mm -hmm. but not just token, but a lot of things that were based from token, like the, I guess you can say the ripple effect of mm -hmm. token's ideas. Um, I was thinking about this when it came to games like Vampire the Masquerade, Mage the Ascension, um, what was it? Scion, Aberrant, um, a lot of the games that we covered on, a, oh, Nobilis, uh, okay. a lot of the games that we covered on um, <clears throat> Fluff Talk, and I was inspired by this because of something that um, that the Vikings said. Check okay. them out um, on Instagram at d20chef, which is... And a lot like every fantasy trope, all the coolest times and uh, all the coolest times in fantasy happened thousands of years ago, and you missed it. <laughs> and um, I started questioning, like, why is that? Why is, why was it, forty thousand years ago we had the king that ruled for ten thousand years? Uh, that that's yeah. directly from Game of Thrones. Yeah. In Game of Thrones, in the Song of Ice and Fire. Way, way to the east, they have the Golden Kingdom and the kingdoms that are named after um, all the precious stones. Yeah. And the Golden King did reign for 10,000 years. Yeah. And what I noticed was that <clears throat> Dungeons & Dragons is about the only fantasy thing that has the this epically magical thing with hundreds of battles and stuff for the fate of mankind and the importance of the universe happened 10,000 years ago and you weren't there. But guess what? It's happening again right now yeah. and you're here. Yeah. Um, and that's, so it, that's very integral changed. to D&D. &D. Like the mm -hmm. past was epic and the past was magical, but the, the present is not necessarily less so. Yes. Um, in some of the settings, in many of the settings, it is. Um, you know, the, the, they absolutely pulled directly from that trope. Like, yeah, the past was epic and magical and the present is less or, or not at all. And we have to go back and find relics from this ancient time to get that magic. Um, and there, like I say, D and D does a pretty good job in the standard settings of just allowing like, look, man, epic stuff happened. Epic stuff can still happen. You, you can still be a wizard who does great magical stuff. There's still great magical wizards out there. But, you know, it, there's also a ton of dungeons and ruins of civilizations <laughs> and magical items and yeah, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, and, you know, again, like I said, for D&D, &D, it still has that caveat of, and 10,000 years from now, 
people are going to be looking at your stuff. Yeah. Going, Look at these ancient things. But in a lot of fantasy, um, and this is the fantasy trope because of the Tolkien stuff, um, is the past was better, it was more potent, or the past was more potent, men were better, women were better, mm-hmm. um, you know, they were more, everything that you, you think makes today wondrous. Yeah. There was more of it back then. Or, or explicitly, there is less of it today. Rather, you know, phrase it differently. Because mm-hmm. it's not that there was more of it back then. Back then was the default. That was, the world was just <laughs> magical. And today, it's less magical. Not because there was more produced back then, but because we have, and this is the legacy of Tolkien, we have through our collective civilization's actions, removed magic from the world. The act of building cities, the act of cutting down forests, is paving over and destroying the magical parts of the world, and as a result, we have less of that now. And the only ways to get it are to go to these primordial places and to find these relics of ancient times and dig through, you know, libraries of dusty tomes that no one has looked at in a thousand years and, you know, that sort of stuff. Right, and... What I'm definitely noticing is that, again, this is one of the big reasons that people that are like me um, have such a hard time with a lot of modern fantasy and a lot of um, modern entertainment as a whole. And this is why. Um, Take my skin color and my economic status off of the table. Okay. Okay. I'm only going to bring up the fact that it has become standard and mundane to sit on a chair in the sky, to talk to potentially millions of people all over the world in basically real time. You only get like a um, a six second to um, three minute lag depending on where on the planet you're sending the transmission. Right, and um, how you're sending it. Yeah, Yeah. Um, and we have cured diseases we can change the human body to where, you know, we've got technology that has discovered that sometimes you weren't, um, that sometimes you're born in bodies that don't exactly belong to you, and we can change that? Yeah. You know, um, like our technology is honestly magical. Yes, somebody out there is going to quote, well, magic is just technology yeah. that you have. Uh, stop. The effects, the effects of what we're living in today are way beyond what even the Enlightenment oh, thinkers were absolutely. thinking, were considering as something more than metaphor. Um, and I, I actually had an interesting discussion with a friend of mine directly related to this, okay. because he, you know, you and I use the term magic very similarly mm-hmm. in terms of, like, the the effort that you can exert your will upon the world and make change. And, you know, this, this idea of spell components is not crushing a beetle necessarily, but it's like, well... I had to, like, talk to people, call in favors, do a bunch of work, uh, you know, basically jump through a bunch of hoops, and I was able to acquire a cheap air conditioner, and now, a, a, you know, a frost spell has been cast on this room. <laughs> and you could argue, like, nah, man, you just went and you bought an air conditioner. And, and so I was discussing this with my friend, and he is vehemently against the idea that magic, as you and I describe it, is magic. He's like, no, that's not magic. That is, magic is something that is literally supernatural. And I'm like, well... How exactly you you know because he's a he's a very staunch atheist so for him the idea is that magic has to be something that doesn't exist, Ma- like literally magic cannot exist therefore what you're describing cannot be magic. You know what's funny about that? What's that? So says the physicist that used to work for the Jet Propulsion Laboratories. Yeah. You know resistors and capacitors. Okay. Are nothing but stones. Mm-hmm. They're little shiny rocks. Mm-hmm. Some are quartz. Yep. <laughs> some are ceramic. Some are, they but, are magic rocks that, because uh, of their magic properties, power our entire technology today. Because of the way that they are arranged yep. and certain energy is going yep. through them. You, you take you take <laughs> magic rocks and magic metals and arrange them in certain ways, and you apply heat. And then you've got internet porn. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, yeah. And, like, it's, yeah. it's fantastic. Because, again, to me, that is literally nothing short of magic. And, like, that's modern magic, but magic's been around a long time. I mean, you can pick up... You can pick up a book, and you can literally 
have someone potentially dead for hundreds of years speak to you telepathically in your own brain without a single sound being uttered. If that's not magic, I'm not entirely sure what your definition oh, is. I'll go a step further with that. Each of us has at least the entire Library of Alexandria in our pocket. Yeah. But even more every day, we have billions of scribes that used to be dressed in robes yep. that are able to make a book yep. in 30 minutes. Yep. We've got a whole bunch of people going, ah, 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 yep. here's a Bible, or in our case, ah, 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 ah. give it to the artist. Give it to the calculators. Here's your character sheet, my liege. Absolutely. And um, I'm talking about printers, by the way. Just, yeah. you know, that kind and, of thing. And to loop it back around to fantasy, the idea that we somehow live in a less magical age is something very much tied to what my friend is saying in that they have forgotten <laughs> what magic is. And their definition of it is literally... Magic is something that cannot exist now. Therefore, it does not exist now. So we have to look at the past and the stories of mythology and say, well, obviously that was magic because it couldn't exist now. <laughs> and, and literally, it's a, circular, it's a circular argument because it's like, well, why was the past better? Well, because the, few, like, the past doesn't exist now. Okay, well, why doesn't the past exist now? Well, because magic is dead. Well, why is magic dead? Well, because it was in the past. <laughs> it is, you, you can't get anywhere with that and you're not allowed to look at it as an evolution of anything because the past happened it was obviously better because it was you know <laughs> because of reasons and now we have the present and it's obviously worse because there's no magic and you you can't you can't argue with these people that well no your magic has changed forms right. magic is different but it's still there it's still magic and they, they don't want to hear it because magic is somebody waving a wand and having fire shoot out. Or changing the image on my black mirror to tell me something different. Yes, I still use remote control. Um, <laughs> and that's exactly yeah, my um, point. Like, the magic is there. It's just become so mundane that we don't look at it as magic anymore. Aha. Uh -huh. And you see, um, this is where, um, and now we're going to talk about that cultural context. Because the cultural context from whence I came <clears throat> was... Um, what was it? A lot of violence, a lot of poverty, a lot of, a lot of looking toward the future because today sucks. And the marginalized in society, not just American society, but the marginalized all over the place, mm -hmm. once looked at mythology like, what was it? It was, one day the Picard will come and things will be better. Yeah. Or, um... One day, um, because we are the chosen people, we will find the promised land. Mm -hmm. You know, we shall get to the top of the mountain um, type thing. But those who are in circumstances to where every single day is a reminder that things aren't great, especially great in comparison to the rest of the paradigm, that's where we tend to look to the future. Yeah. We tend to look to sci-fi going, the final frontier where um Weird. yes there are people out there that are complaining about a freaking starship that has a <sighs> woman captain and a person of color not realizing that in the original series there was a canadian a jew a black dude a yeah. russian and a japanese person and very much on purpose the, yeah very, very, very much, on, much purpose. on purpose right yeah you know so the future is diverse the future yeah. is i'm not gonna say hopeful but the hope that is in the future is that the problems that plague us now will be sorted out so that we can finally get on to the next set. I think you're problems. almost there. I think the okay. the the real thing is that there, the hope is that we can take actions now and that the future can be better. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, a, it's a very basic shift in that mentality. Like, the past was better. There and and there's nothing we can do to go back, really. But we can we can idealize the past and like try to maybe reclaim some of that glory. Versus, we can take actions now and through our actions make things better. We can you know go into a future and because the future didn't just get itself sorted out, <laughs> people sorted it out. Well, this is funny. This very discussion that we're having. Take a look, kids, because this is what it looks like. Is actually 
dissonance between our two cultures. Mm. Because I'm where I talk about, you know, the future has that hope. Yeah. You're absolutely right in the sense of people have that done. But the disenfranchised don't tend to believe that we're the ones with the power to make that happen. Mm. The world will sort itself out, but I can't make the world sort itself out because I'm not listened to now. My vote today doesn't matter. So you but, have to wait for it yes. to have sorted itself out before you can enjoy. The, exact the mundo. Interesting. Interesting. That is yeah. that is a cultural d- divide there <laughs> yeah. that I had not recognized. Yeah, no, it, it's one of those things. Yeah, so. and and um, something I wanted to bring up. You know, we talked about Star Trek a lot because yeah. it's, it's kind of the I would say the high water mark for what a good it is to positive science fiction. What Lord of the Rings is to fantasy. Absolutely, so. absolutely. And I wanted to bring up something else that a lot of people incorrectly lump into science fiction, which is Star Wars. Mm. Star Wars is fantasy. And in in Star no, Wars, no, it's got spaceships sure. and a princess and a wizard and a pirate and a magic sword. Yeah, okay? it is a fairy tale. Absolutely. So said George Lucas. It's literally fantasy. <laughs> it's a fantasy World War II story. I mean, that's yeah. that's what it is. But part of the setting that is absolutely inherent to Star Wars is that it is a fantasy setting, and in that fantasy setting, you are in a dark age. Yes. And that dark age, you know, literally, Obi-Wan Kenobi says, these are the dark times, you know, this is (laughs) before the dark times, before the Empire. Yeah. That was, you know, there was a good time in the past, and that good time is gone now. And the past was better, and maybe we can never get it back, but we we can try to, you know, to fight against the bad times we're in now. Well, part of the overall story of Star Wars, if you start looking at the prequels as well, that Dark Age is a lot bigger than before the Empire. This is a Dark Age forever. This is a Dark Age of thousands of years where even the Jedi have lost track of what used to be good and they've gotten stuck in their ways and things have gotten bad for everyone. Technology hasn't really progressed in you know from the original trilogy to the prequel or from the prequels to the original, I should say. Right. And technology hasn't really progressed in the new movies either. You know, decades, yeah, decades, centuries, millennia go by, and the galaxy stagnates. Hey, lightsabers got crossbars. <laughs> oh, anyway, um, yeah, technology doesn't really change or progress, and that's essential to the setting. One of the themes of Star Wars is the the cyclical nature of history, which is a theme in mythology, which George Lucas pulled heavily from. Um, in most human myths, well, I should say most human cultures before um, before the Industrial Revolution, really, you mm-hmm. know, before the Enlightenment and the Industrial Revolution, uh, I'm speaking, putting on my historian hat here, um, part of the problem and the reason history is such a modern invention is that history was cyclical to people. Mm-hmm. They, they didn't think of it in terms of like a linear progression of time. It was, you know... Everything was the seasons were cyclical. Empires rose and fell, and the new empires rose in their place. Uh, you know, you you uh, you are a father. You have a son. Your son will grow to be a father, and he will have a son, and so on. Things cycle forever. The sins of the father are going to be the sins of the son, and a lot of mythology deals directly with how to either break the cycle or how to fulfill your destiny in that cycle and participate in it. Right, where sci-fi tends to ask the question, um, we have now broken the cycle. Humanity has finally made it. We are finally there. What now? Yep. Well, do we continue the cycle somewhere else with other species? Or do we help others through their cycle? Or do we learn what comes next and see... That level of possibility, the actual unknown, the breaking of the wheel and going towards something else. um, Again, this is really a disenfranchised thing because the disenfranchised come in two flavors primarily. And those are the ones whose will has been broken to believe that there can be nothing but this. And those who hate this so much that they can't not imagine something better yeah and we can't look to the past because the past how can i put it well today sucks so hard because this is how it has always been the past was no different um yeah it was different in technique but the effects 
were the same. Yeah, the past was different, but it still sucked, I think, is, <laughs> is, the, is, is the takeaway there. And mm-hmm. in my opinion, the best science fiction writing, and this applies to the best Star Trek episodes, this, the, you know, the best parts of Star Wars, this applies to the best you know literature that you can read, it all deals with exactly what you're saying. Breaking that wheel, and usually that wheel coming back in some form or another, and the characters needing to decide how to interact with this piece of the past coming back. Because again, that's part of mythology. That's part of like, well, the past is repeating itself again, because again, in mythology, that's what happens all the time. The past mm-hmm. always repeats itself. So Only to a lesser degree, because each turn of the wheel is less potent than the last. So. In I would say in fantasy, yes. In okay. myth, not necessarily. Okay, Each yeah. turn of the wheel, and that's part of the thing, fantasy is a reflection of myth. And okay. that's, that's what Tolkien said, is each turn of the wheel is lesser. It's a shadow of itself uh, every little bit. And every, you know, it's become the background radiation for every fantasy story. Is, you know, every iteration of the past repeating itself, things have gotten a little bit worse and a little bit darker and a little bit less magical and, you know, and so on and so forth. Um, but it's the idea in... in uh, in most mythology is the past is just going to repeat itself. Like right. people are going to come across the same situations. And oftentimes in the story, they are aware that the past is repeating itself and try to do something different. And then a self-fulfilling prophecy happens and they end up repeating the same thing anyway, <laughs> despite their best efforts. Right. So in good science fiction, again, you're looking at it and you're going, okay, we want to break this wheel. We want to do things differently. How do we do it so we don't become a self-fulfilling prophecy <laughs> that then just repeats the mistakes of the past because, you know, whatever happened. And that, those are the best stories. The absolute, you know, one of my favorite Star Trek episodes. It was one of the really early ones. Season one or two from Next Generation was... Wow. Um, <laughs> It was the one where... When no one believed that the show was going to get a yeah, second season. Yeah. How wrong were they? Oh, man. <laughs> um, but that was... It was the one where... Um, they are trying to dismantle Data because they want him... They, they consider him to be property of the Federation. Oh, and, yes. And Picard is arguing that, like, no, he is a person. He is an officer. He is a part of my crew. He is an individual. He is a person. And again, it's a story that has been written a zillion times in history of, like, no, this person is not property. This person <laughs> is an individual who has value above and beyond his component parts, above and beyond his role that he has been prescribed. Now we need to convince someone in a position of authority that this person is worth saving. And that's literally what this episode is. is Picard literally goes to court and advocates on the behalf of Data and saying like, no, he is a person who you don't get to just dismantle to look at his brain. He's, you know, he's not just a tool. He is a, a human being in every sense other than his biology. Right. And it's a brilliant episode, but again, it's the past is repeating itself and a, per, a person in a position of power is losing track of the personhood of an individual. And so to break that wheel, you need to prove that this, this is not a slave. Right. This is a, this is a person. Yeah. Right. And it's actually funny because um, it's one of my favorite fantasy novels or one of my favorite fantasy series is, is Frank Herbert's Dune. Mm, Talking yeah. about um, the whole mythology and the repeating oh God, of the wheel yeah. and all that stuff. Again, I am, yes, it is 15,000 pages, but no exaggeration, actually. They're, they're long books. They and are there's really, a lot of them. Yeah. Um, and, you know, looking at the politics and the economic politics mm-hmm. of... Um, the fantasy stuff that goes through. And this is one of the big things that really spawned this question after I brought it up because Dune is one of the fantasy um, fantasy p- or f- fantasy fiction that doesn't glorify the past. Right. It says today is amazing because we've got instantaneous travel across space. Yeah. But we're still dealing with the politics between ancient houses. Yeah, like there's there's (laughs) fighting for resources. Part of what I love about the setting of Dune is it's like it's in the far future, but there's this weird mid. You know, again, talking about that dark age. Yeah, like a lot of science fiction deals with the fact that even though we're in the future, we're dealing with a dark age where technology hasn't really progressed, or like for some reason, a lot of stuff hasn't progressed. Dune is that as well. You know, you have a very medieval noble household that acts very much like European medieval nobles dealing with really what's an upstart you know gentry class and the the contact between the two and you know 
dealing with native peoples who are, again, very traditional and not very modern in their outlooks, but have the strong mythological <laughs> history repeats itself and, you know, trying to mesh those two together. And it's, it's an amazing story because it handles all that so well. But you're right. Like, nobody's looking at the past like, well... Things sure were great ten thousand years ago. It's like, man, ten thousand no, years were ago. Was... Like, no, ten thousand years ago, you know, we were all stuck on the planets that we were in. Yep. And when we ran out of resources, we almost died. Yeah. <laughs> that sucked. But then yeah. came these worm people that said, Hey, we can fix this and we can show you how. And like in you the know? in the very first book, the Benny Jesserits are their entire thing is trying to like <clears throat> mold the future to be better. Mm -hmm. To like to, to select lineages and put people together in such a way that they're like, look, the past sucked. Nothing eugenic about that. Nothing. Well, <laughs> yeah, eugenics and science fiction are just right yeah, here they, all they, the time. They, it's, it's, it's sorry that yeah, that is how it's it goes. a it's a good theme to explore, and mm -hmm. it explores better in science fiction than it does in fantasy. It's true. Um, not that fantasy doesn't explore it, but you know, in fact, if you guys know of good fantasy explorations of the question of eugenics, I would love to read more of that. But again, it, it mostly shows up in science fiction and how people kind of deal with that. And again, different ways, different series. Star Trek obviously deals a lot with it. Um, but yeah, the idea like, look, we're trying to make the future better. You may question our methods about it. <laughs> as you know, again, the Bene Gesserits are not cast in a favorable light for doing so. But most of the time, the people who are taking extreme measures to make the future better are usually doing so saying that the ends are going to justify the means. Right. We're going to make a better future, and we're going to drag you kicking and screaming to a better world. Right. You know, and I don't know. I, I think it's a it's a neat exploration topic. I would generally disagree that the ends justify the means, but I also one of those people who believes there are no ends. There are only means. <laughs> and, you know, anyway. Yeah. So, I mean, th these are, you know, this is the stuff that we wanted to bring up today because – you know, oh, this is going to spark discussion. and um, I hope so. It's and, a good discussion. Yeah, it's one of those things. But speaking of sparking discussion, that is what I want to talk about in our final segment today. Okay. Which is, of course, the writing the writing tools that help us become better GMs. Yes. Okay. Um, or better and, writers in general. Yeah, 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 well, not everybody wants to be a writer. Not everybody wants to. But just when it comes to coming up with ideas, yeah. I, I use writing in a scientific formulaic way to help me think about multiple ideas yeah. and think about consequences. <laughs> um, yeah. Mm, excuse me. But yeah, um, a few things have occurred to me about a lot of stuff this week. Okay. Um, and that is, um, you know, we covered, but therefore we yeah. covered, um, comedy and drama, uh, we covered Bathos, which I'm not a big fan of. Now, yes, yes. We, we remember um, from that episode. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, had, okay. you had a few thoughts on that. Yeah. Well, here's an interesting thing. I, I'm bringing this up because um, it's worthwhile to explore. Mm -hmm. This weekend, the, I guess you can say the ugly duckling of the blockbuster movie world. Okay. Just busted a billion dollars. Okay. And I'm talking, of course, about Warner Brothers' DCEU production of Aquaman. Ah, yes. Yeah. I've not seen it yet. Yeah, Aquaman busted a billion dollars overseas. Mm. And that needs to be... Yeah. Um, that needs to be explained. I've been, I've been doing a lot of studying um, on film, and, you know, I read a lot of opinions. I read a lot of stuff. And... There are the tribalists of Marvel, the tribalists of DC. Aquaman is an interesting take, though, because, okay. as you know, I've always been in his camp. Mm -hmm. I've always been in Aquaman's camp because the idea of someone who rules three-quarters of the planet that we know nothing about that's filled with monsters, death, disease, wrapped in wet, cold darkness really intrigues me. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, it's, yeah. It's, a, it's a neat setting, and... I again having not being a general comic book guy in general, mm -hmm. um, most of my exposure to Aquaman has just been people crap talking Aquaman. Yeah, exactly. You know exactly. And um, but this brings up a different thing, which is storytelling through cultures. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is a huge thing because the United States, half of them hated just the Aquaman thing. The Aquaman joke throughout years is oh. 
he talks to fish well what if he's in santa fe new mexico right you know and um it, it's kind of there are cultures that you're not going to win the battle against i sure. don't mean national cultures but i mean familial cultures um Sometimes you're going to deal with a player or an audience member that just isn't going to like what you do. Yeah. And that means I, I bring up the Aquaman thing because there are people who, A, have just decided that the DC Extended Universe is terrible. Yeah. And they will not be moved unless a superhero movie from DCEU either makes them feel like it, like superhero movies did when they were kids <laughs> or it wins an Oscar. Yeah. Unless those two, those two circumstances are both yeah. done in one movie, <clears throat> everything from it sucks. Yeah. Um, and and until until uh, DC makes a movie that makes you feel the way Iron Man 1 did... Uh, and you know does it with the same level of kind of low key like yeah we just made a movie we're not going to make a big deal about it and then you just discover this gym and it's amazing until dc does that now they're not going to make good movies i don't know what you're talking about yeah exactly um and then there are those people who are just committed to liking either one and one of the things that <clears throat> aquaman definitely showed us is something that i tout about a lot which is um, something we brought up a little earlier in the first segment, which is this might not be for you. Yeah. You might not be the audience. Um, as a GM, especially with weekly one shots, which is the Saturday show, um, I have to juggle like who's in the show, how their personalities are going to, who's at the table, mm -hmm. how are their personalities going to mesh, and will we be able to get through the game with engagement from everyone? Yeah. I didn't say enjoyment. I said engagement. Yep. You know, i.e., how can I keep people off of their phones? And how can I keep people from trying to derail the adventures because of whatever it is is going through their head? Yeah. You know, can I engage um, in a way that distracts them from the thing that they're not liking? Or have they already made that decision? Now, when James Wan was making Aquaman, I got something really interesting because I saw it in theaters. And you know what that was? What was that? This isn't made for an American audience. Mm. I thought about that because... Which is interesting mm -hmm. considering it's a movie made by Americans starring Americans. You know, in America. Yeah, in America. like. <laughs> you but know. yeah, not for you people. Yeah. Huh. Um, primarily, I took a, and I was watching this movie and the dialogue. The dialogue and the delivery of the dialogue was so strange. Not because I'm looking at Atlanteans, but I'm going, the cadence of this is off, the wording is off, and I bet this is easy to translate. Hmm. I bet you can do some, I bet you can do ADR with this really easily and write subtitles for this very easily. <laughs> yeah, so it's probably very easy for, say, a Chinese audience to parse what's going on because the dialogue, I'm guessing, having not seen it, it's not too fast, decent pauses for people to catch up on subtitles, uh, words are not weird, not a lot of strange colloquialisms from America, stuff like that? Um, yeah, there's not very many idioms. Yep. Very not, not, not very many idioms. Not saying that it is said slowly or with a lot of pauses, but again, once you watch the movie, you'll see like, yeah, this probably would translate pretty well. And sure enough, overseas, it busted the one billion dollar mark, hmm. which means that this was this was a movie made <clears throat> by Americans in America, with American properties and American um, and American production teams and American writers for someone else. Yeah, written and, e and on top of all that, in English. <laughs> yes, right. Yeah, American, literally, at every stage, but designed to not be for Americans. Exactly. So, as a GM, you have to ask yourself the question, who are you writing for? And as a player, as a player or as a consumer of entertainment goods, you have to ask yourself, am I who this is for? Yeah. I will tell you this flat out. There was a lot of popular things that I just don't care about. Sure. I'm not saying they're bad quality, I just don't give a damn. Yeah. I really don't. Um, sorry, 
regardless of my rants against Joss Whedon, I don't care about Buffy. I'm not a 17-year-old suburbanite white girl who could possibly grow up to be a mean person but then gets labeled with responsibility that has to learn to be a better person. That doesn't resonate with me. Yeah. Um, Arrested Development didn't resonate with me because I am not a terrible... Um, I'm not a terrible person from the upper middle class of Orange County, California, yep. who is so self-absorbed <laughs> that I don't notice that everyone around me um, doesn't just need therapy, but that my dad who's in prison is exactly where he needs to be along with the rest of the family. Yeah. I don't care. That's not. Um, yeah. And that's just, understanding well, that just like I don't expect you to care about higher learning from John Singleton about the black dude that will get to college and yeah. um, the other stuff that happens to him after he gets to college or um, or Boys in the Hood or um, Moonlight. I, I don't expect you... Well, that's you know. what I was going to say. is like, at the same time that you're feeling like, well, all this, you know, all these shows that are very popular among mostly white people... Um, and therefore get a lot of common recognition because white people control the media. Yeah. Um, all of these shows are not appealing to you at the same time that most white people go, well, I don't get black comedy. Aha. <laughs> and, you know, there's nothing inherently wrong with that. But again, white people are not the audience of black comedy because the, there's different cultural contexts there. I, you know, I... I don't particularly care for Arrested Development either. I know. I'm like, <laughs> all of you people just don't at me. I just... Eh. also not coming from the upper middle class uh, background. I'm just like, you guys all just suck and I don't like this show. But anyway, um, but there's, there's absolutely that, that thing you're talking about. We're like, that show was made for people more like me than for like you. Mm -hmm. And I can see where it's just like, yeah, that show just missed me. Like it just, it came at me and I just went, no, this is not for me. And I just walked away from it because it's not a show for me. Right. So what does this have to do with writing exercises? Well, when you're doing the buts and therefores mm -hmm. as a writer, you have to ask yourself that question, who am I writing this for? And once you answer that question, there comes a follow-up. Am I writing it only for them? Yeah. You see, um, again, Aquaman being the example that we're using today, it was not written only for the Chinese market. It was also written for children. Yep. Um, Cause it's very child friendly. Good. It's very child friendly. Good. Um, so it was written for American children. It was written for the Chinese market. It was written for those of us who wanted to see Aquaman done in a way that was not mocking. Yeah. Uh, we wanted to see it done respectfully. And it was, it was respectful of Aquaman, his capability, and all that stuff. So, um, I'm, I'm, I'm when gonna, you're, well, let me, okay, let me finish yeah. my thing. Um, when you're writing your story or crafting your adventure, when you come up with your idea, what am I writing, who am I writing this for? If you're writing it specifically for column A, then you either have to close the door to column B, or, <clears throat> you have to write column A that is for column A, but respectful of column B, which means you can say that column A is the best, but you don't have to be mean to column B in right. order to show that column A is the best, you know? Yeah, and I had an interesting example of this in um, Shadowrun, which oh, yeah. is fantastic game. The um, run! Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oof, yeah, but it's... Um, it's a game that, whether you like it or hate it, no one can deny that it is trying to do too many things at once. And again, if you're into that, cool. It's got like four different rule sets <laughs> that operate simultaneously in the same game. Um, and one of the long running jokes about Shadowrun is there's two main ways to play Shadowrun. You play either pink mohawk or black trench coat. And people are like, what, what are you talking about? I had both. Well, exactly. In real life. <laughs> and, yeah, if you think, like, well, what is Pink Mohawks? Like, look, if you imagine it's 1987 and you are watching a movie about a cyberpunk thing and people have pink mohawks, you immediately know what this movie is going to be like. Mm -hmm. There's going to be uh, loud punks, 
uh, people firing machine guns into the air, fast cars that are slamming into each other, you know, like everything's gonna be fast paced, high octane, and, and it's gonna be an action thing. And then if you're talking about a black trench coat sort of game, again, if you're thinking about a Matrix. Yeah, well, <laughs> Matrix, but even maybe less combat oriented. More Matrix, yeah. Yeah, more <laughs> the, more of the like, okay, we need to like plan a thing. We need to like go in, we need to be super subtle about it, we're gonna be super serious, we're gonna be planning out every aspect of this, you know, and it's it's almost the opposite of the other one, where like in Black Trench Coat, everything every step of the planning matters. It's a very cerebral sort of experience where you're trying to anticipate this and and make all these plans. Pink Mohawk is like, woo, Libra Jenkins <laughs> and you go out and you have some fun. Um I the game that I played was mainly a black trench coat style game. Which several of the players were really into and the DM was really into, but a couple of the other players were just bored senseless. And they didn't like they were not really invested in this idea that a role playing experience can or should have that level of cerebral component. They wanted to sit down, roll some dice, have some cinematic stuff blow up, and that was what they wanted out of their experience. And trying to reconcile those two, trying to get the the black trench coat to enjoy a pink mohawk and vice versa was a huge problem. And, you know, again, that idea of like, who is your audience? It's like, well, it's at some point you have to kind of recognize that maybe this black trench coat thing, you're not the audience and you need to enjoy it for what it is. And then talk to the DM and be like, hey, can we do a little bit more of this pink mohawk stuff later? I, you know, can we find a balance between the two? But at the same time, don't just be on your phone while people are planning. Like, try to participate. <laughs> And that is exactly it. So, um, yeah, it, this is this is one of those things where, again, um, when you ask yourself that question, um, you know, am I being respectful to the other ones? Am I am I integrating some pink mohawk? Let's talk about one or two ways to integrate um, the other stuff. Because again, Aquaman did this beautifully. Yeah. As far as a film goes, um, it was bright and colorful. You know for kids yeah um it showed a lot of kid stuff mm -hmm. like a lot of children specifically like young arthur you know for kids um it showed monsters lots and lots of monsters yep. you know for kids and them toys um for the ladies you had the jason momoa yeah hey hey for hey look some of us guys can appreciate Jason Momoa too. I'm just saying. Getting there. <laughs> For the guys. You had Jason Momoa. Yeah. Yeah. You know? <laughs> like there literally is a scene in the movie where you think it's going to be a bar fight. Instead, it turns into him drinking with his buddies and taking selfies. <laughs> That's good. That's <laughs> I mean, seriously, it's like, whoa. So, you know, you got I really need to watch this movie. I got to I got to figure out if I can have time to see it in the theaters because if I see it with my daughter, it's just going to be her singing Baby Shark for the whole time and uh, <laughs> I'm not sure I'm okay with that. So. Well, yeah. Um and for the horror fans, my favorite scene in the entire movie, and of course this is James Wan, the director of um Annabelle and, and that whole series. Yeah. Um it was bloody terrifying. I I nice. had to look at the whole thing from third party omniscient because if I were to project myself onto the main characters, nope, nope, nope. Uh -uh, <laughs> You're nope. just gonna nope right out of that whole situation, nope, huh? Nope, yeah. yeah. Essentially, they're on a boat, they're surrounded by monsters, and the only way to, and when I say surrounded, think the mines of Moria from, <laughs> from gotcha. Fellowship of the Rings. Except, these aren't mines, it's just water. Yep. Just water. So my hydrophobic buttocks is going, <laughs> nope. And, oh, yeah, they breathe underwater, and they're pretty much um, anthropomorphic anglerfish that like eating your tasty, tasty meats that they haven't had for a while. Horrifying. So, yeah, horrifying. Yeah, yeah th that's yeah. it. And and it's at night. So the only way to get away from them is to jump into the dark, cold, wet, monster-infested water. Yeah. And when I say monster-infested, it's a super wide shot that makes the boat that they're on that big yeah that big yeah i'm just gonna hard nope right out of that. <laughs> exactly no. and i'm going this was fun this was, yes yes that that was what i was looking for so it's got a little bit for everybody just to say this isn't for you and the current market in china currently is exactly that most of the movies coming out of Hong Kong is a little bit of everybody, a little bit of everything, because they're very 
very integral with their experience. They like a little bit of everything. A little drama, a little comedy, a little, little, little stuff, and they're not as puritanical as we are. So it's a whole family experience they give for everything. Now, when you're... Yeah, a little bit of violence, a little bit of sex, a little bit of horror, a little bit of comedy, yeah. a little bit, you know, like, I, which I can appreciate, but again, it's so different from the American idea of like, yeah, you make, whoop, you make a drama, mm -hmm. you make a comedy, and your comedy may have some dramatic moments, but they just lead to more comedy, right. and like, your comedy is probably like, unless you're making a comedy horror movie or what, you know, well, there's not, not a lot of just crossover. That. It's you make a comedy for me. Yeah. You make a drama. For me. Yeah. And if I don't like it, I will go to Netflix and find something for me. Yeah. I will see, like, when, um, God, what was it? When Man of Steel came out, um, I'm like, you know, I kind of dug it. You know, I kind of dug Man of yeah. Steel. I like the different take. I'm looking at it for what it is, and someone's like, Bleh. it wasn't Superman, just go see Deadpool. I'm like, okay, I get that you only have the budget to go see one movie at a yeah. time. But... I can appreciate these merits. I, I can appreciate these things for their own merits. And, you know, when you're writing, you have to ask yourself, the audience that I'm aiming this to, will they appreciate it for what it is? Do I make 10% of the audience laugh at 10 different times during the performance to right. have 100% laughter? Or am I trying to appease a single ideal? If you are not set in this idea when you first start to write the outline for your adventure you're going to come across problems yeah you're I, I see exactly what you mean like if you have a you know a dedicated focus like we're gonna make a movie about this thing with this tone and and you do it well oh my god these are some of the best movies ever made mm -hmm. but at the same time if you come into it saying we're gonna appeal which is I, I think a lot of the appeal of a lot of the marvel movies is they come in saying look we're gonna kind of appeal to everyone in some senses and we're gonna have a little bit for everyone a little bit of comedy a little bit of drama a little bit of action a little bit of whatever and you do you start from that perspective and you do it well and you cast it well and you do all that that movie's very successful as well for different reasons aha yeah. thank you that that's exactly the thing so when you're going in for your outline understand what you're trying to accomplish the why that you want to accomplish and we'll we'll explore more on the why of that next week because sadly we're running out of time yes it is about <laughs> you know? that time yeah, yeah it is about that time so i'm so glad we had this time together <laughs> just to drop an anvil on your head bing okay so um but with that um you know thanks for actually showing up again i know it's been a rough week and a rough morning yeah um yeah. but thanks for showing up to have this discussion with me <laughs> hey man i'm always happy to be here I'm, i was very excited we talked about uh Talked about doing this discussion. I've been telling all my friends about it. Um, you know, kind of, you posted on Deckers on the book. We got some ideas from there. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, it's a cool topic. Um, I, I definitely would love to dig more into our second segment topic about, um, you know, the, the chronological snobbery and uh, get some more examples. But, like, this is something that is a really cool idea that I'm, I'm always pumped to, like, show up here and talk mm -hmm. about nerd stuff. Oh, yeah. Well, we'll get to that. But next week, we are actually going to talk um about um the thing that makes your story special okay and um or the thing that makes your rpg special and breaks it simultaneously i'm talking of course about magic or alien technology yeah okay because soon Which, we're going to be well we're <laughs> going to be um we're um, we're going to do this because we're going to cover next week kids on bikes Ooh. we're going to be talking about kids on bikes i'm going to try and do just at least a one shot couple hour playthrough sometime this week and yeah. one thing i've noticed about game. kids on bikes there are no magics there are no superpowers that your character can have right so it's like going through DD &D as a fighter yeah but you're just a kid and um one of the things that fifth edition did that i love but i kind of see the inherent dangers of is that they opened up a magic thing for every character class i did notice to, that to make them yeah. feel more than human and the question is is this necessary so the question uh, so what we're going to cover next week is the importance of skills um and not having the super tech or magical power should, or should i say the importance of hawkeye in the avengers mm. 
Okay. You know? Oh man, yeah, I got <laughs> I got some thoughts on this right now. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to, to back out because like <laughs> gotta wait a week for this. But yeah. Yeah. So that's that's what we're gonna do. So you guys have a week to think about this, and if you want to talk to us a little bit more about it, you know, give your ideas, give some of your thoughts. That's perfectly cool. I'm just asking that you hit us up. Oh, look at what I did there at back in the deck at gmail.com. That's b a c k i n t h e d e c k at gmail.com. You can also check out the archive over on YouTube at YouTube. You know, look up BitP. That's where we're going to be putting our um, our video logs and you know just our quick like, hey, what's up? This is what we're doing. This is what we're going on. Um, you can also follow us on Twitter at back in the deck. We're more active on that now that things have slowed down and I've got the Wizards Tower put back together. If you really want to get into this discussion because you just can't wait till next week. Oh my god, I can't wait. I hate Hawkeye. I love Hawkeye. Well, you're wrong because you do Well, you're just stupid. Well, don't do that. But you can get into a little bit of a discussion if you join the Deckers on the Book on Facebook. That's Deckers, like you guys, on the book or on the Facebooks. Um, but if you're a lot like me and you work until four in the morning and you have to ride home in the rain half blind, then don't watch us because you're half blind and you're riding a motorcycle and you might die. But you can listen to us on SoundCloud at soundcloud.com slash BID underscore P. And of course, follow us on the Instagram at Back in the Deck. Um, again, I want to thank you guys for showing up today because um, without your help and support, we wouldn't do it. So I def- well, we'd be doing it, but it just wouldn't make any more sense. I want to thank uh, the Duggernaut. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, there we go. And of course, I need to thank our people over in NP City. Thank you, Deck Mob, for showing up. Yeah. And actually, like, you guys have been on it in the conversations today. Um, please, um, one more time, just give a thought to coming down to our Patreon and checking out all the good stuff that we have over there. Become a patron. You can actually help us out for as little as a dollar a month. Uh, we've got one dollar tier, five dollar tier, ten, twenty, fifty, all the way up to a hundred. Um, but a dollar a month. Um, five dollars a month really helps us keep these lights on and will help us get the merch and all that stuff up. oh yeah you know so that's a real thing and we're um i have an appointment uh, within the next couple of weeks to talk to the people at the va to start gaming clubs up for Ooh. our fellow service members that used to play or some of the ones i'm really looking trying to look out for personally which are our vets from vietnam who are still not being treated fairly for the service to their country they're pretty much ruined their lives yeah um so that's what we're trying to do but that kind of thing actually requires material resources like i've got to buy the books yeah get all the copies made for um the character sheets and make sure that everybody has dice and all that stuff so it's a thing it's a real thing and i'm working with a lot of our deckers who are vets so that is a really big thing and from there we're off, we're back off to boys and girls clubs and to the community centers out there and compton watts and um and linwood so that's that's where that thing is going on that so with that i'm going to say thank you guys for showing up again hit us at all the aforementioned places um that you can see on your screen right now and remember if anybody tells you that you can't have the hobbies that you like because the circumstances of your birth be it your race religion creed sexual orientation gender identity disability or your budget you just tell them to take those cards and put them back in the deck thank you guys and we'll see you next time on game gallery Thank mm-hmm. you.